It's always nice to wake up each and every morning, especially Sunday morning, with our minds set on Jesus. So we've been going over the last few weeks talking about is it a biblical principle to be saved for eternity? Once saved, always saved. Is it biblical? And we found out and we're finding out that it very much is a biblical teaching. And it, it is a part of God's promises. And to deny and to reject God's word is to deny and reject Jesus Christ, who says, everyone who believes in me shall never perish, but has eternal life. Everyone who calls upon my name shall be saved. Everyone who believes in the name of Jesus Christ, believes God has risen him from the dead, shall be saved. And his salvation is eternal. And so it makes me wonder, <laughs> how could anyone ever even think or, or believe or come to this place in life where they've lost security or assurance in God's word? And I think a lot of it is because they're, they're so focused on what they're doing. And usually what it comes down to is a lack of what they're doing. They're not doing anything God so has asked them to do, and they know they're a hypocrite. A hypocrite is someone who says, I'm going to do this, but absolutely has no strength or power to back up their words with action. None. It's like, like a person who says, you know, uh, I, I am the guy, if there's a guy out here in the community that, that's going to walk with you and to be with you and to be your friend and, and all that, you know, I'm that guy. And then when you, when you call that person and say, hey, you know, I, I could use your help, I could use your friendship, I, I could use, I don't have time for you. What, what do you think I am? What do you think I am? I, I, you think I'm so unimportant that, that I just got all this time in the world and all the time in the world is just out there waiting for you to come up here and bother me? I ain't got time for you. So they say one thing and then their actions absolutely support something else. They always seek to justify themselves and I, and I, and I understand if you've been watching, I keep beating this this dead horse right into the ground because I would hope and you would come to recognize and understand if there's anything you don't want to be in this world is like this. You don't want to be that person who establishes a sense, their sense of righteousness and virtue over another person because that person is, is undeserving of it. They're undeserving of my goodness. They're undeserving of my mercy. They're undeserving uh, of something, some sort of help. And, and so there, those people always are saying, you know, hey, let's, let's pray and ask for discernment. And the discernment I'm seeking for is the justification not to help you out, not to do any good for you or you. And, and the reason God ha has withhold from me uh, a sense of generosity or charity is because, well, I mean, look at you. Look at how you're living and, and the lifestyle you have chosen to live. And all the while trying to establish their own righteousness and, and then claiming, you know, hey, by the way, you're not saved and you're not saved and, and nobody's saved and boy, the only people who reads the Bible is the devil. The only one quote in the Bible is the devil. And so we can't trust in anyone who quotes from the Bible. We can't trust anyone who's out there dedicating their life to Jesus Christ and the gospel of it. We, we can't trust anyone or anything. And, you know, this is the, the truth behind what it is. If you want to be saved, you, you've got to come to me. I mean, the only thing that is God and the only thing that is godly is the things I approve of. I don't approve of your salvation. I don't approve of your works. I don't approve of your life or your lifestyle or any of those things. 
And all the while, it's them trying to justify sin instead of confessing sin and confessing it's wrong and saying, you know, you know why I don't help you out? I'm a nasty, ravenous wolf within myself. I am a diseased tree, incapable of producing good fruit. People say, and we'll get into this here in a minute, that salvation must, in, in a way, be earned. And how it's earned is you've got to completely follow these rules and these things. And one of the verses they, they claim that pro says our, our salvation is not secure. <coughs> it's seen right there in Matthews chapter 7 as uh, Jesus saying to, to a lawless people, I never knew you. And, and so when we see that, I never knew you. You're, you never had salvation. You were never saved. It wasn't that you were saved and then you lost salvation. Jesus clearly says, I never knew you. And in the same way, we, with our own measure, use it to, to measure ourselves and to destroy ourselves. I, my salvation isn't secure because of the measure I'm using to judge myself. And, and usually it comes through the guilty conscience of already knowing that you, you're not the problem. I'm the problem. See, 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 it doesn't, my generosity, my charity, my, my acts of good can't be generated from me and I'm blaming you for what I can't do. And Jesus saying, I never knew you in the same way these people claim, I never knew you. I never knew you. And so the question isn't, is salvation eternal? Once saved, always saved. The question should be, when am I saved? When am I saved? And then we come here and we look in Matthew chapters 5 through 8, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus saying, this is when you are saved. It's, it's not being a hearer of the word. It's not being a speaker of the word. It's the doers. The doers of the word shall be justified. The doers of the word shall be blessed. Now, yes, of course, Faith comes by hearing, and it comes by hearing the word of God. So there is a time when we are hearers, but our salvation is secured when we become the doers of the word. And it is just as Jesus says, and when he says to Peter, come and follow me. When he says to Andrew, John, James, Bartholomew and on all the rest of the disciples come and follow me and, and they followed him so they were doers they were doers all disciples are some sort of a doer of the word and he says here in uh, chapter 5 let's begin at verse 38 again when am I saved and what does my salvation come from? And it doesn't come from the righteousness or the virtue of myself. It comes through the production of the Holy Spirit. And this is why we must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not so much about being baptized in water. Being baptized in water it is a religious ritual. And it's a confession. I was dead and I was without hope. And while I was dead and without hope, Christ came and rose me up to life. You know, that's something I, I think we seem to struggle with, that we were crucified with Christ 2,000 years ago, and God has risen us back to life. And it's no longer us that lives, but Christ who lives through us. Christ who lives through us. And so it's about the production of the Holy Spirit. God, through the power of his words and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, transforms our heart, our lives, 
our intentions, our everything. And so Jesus says here in verse 38, Matthew chapter 5, You have heard it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. When am I saved? When is my salvation secure? Well, when this is my life. Jesus Christ is the way, the life, and the truth. When this becomes my life. What? This way. And when this truth, as Christ is saying, this is the truth. And this is the life, and this is the way. Be doers of the word. And this becomes a reality. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse from the one who would borrow from you. You know, that, that's why in a lot of our stuff, you know, we, as a small little church here in Ray, Colorado, put out a fundraiser and we sent letters out to every single church in the community. And not only the letters, but backed up the letters with phone calls saying, hey, we're, we're a brother in Christ and we're seeking your help. And, and yet it was amazing that no one from the community except for one family, and I don't want to diminish that family, the Campfield family helped us out. And the Assembly of God took up a small little collection to, to help us out. To help us deal with some real issues and problems that we're having here at the church. And outside of that, no one. Outside of the ministerial alliance that is set in place by a few of these old, dead, dry-boned people. They're whitewashed, they, they look good, they say the right things, but, but they do not have the ability to do any of this stuff. Even having one pastor and preacher come and, and took the time to insult us. You know what was funny, I've seen him three times in this past week, and we even sat right next to him at dinner at the restaurant just a few nights ago. And I'm sure he felt the presence of the Lord, the presence of shame and guilt, as I let him know, you know, I, I, you don't have the right to insult me. And, and I'm strong enough to say, you know what, I, I'm going to address it and I'm going to talk to you about it. It's not that I'm judging you. A lot of people say, stop judging me. I am not judging you. Your actions judge you. Your actions determine who you are and who you're not. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. And so what judges you? Your inability to believe in the truth. I refuse to believe the truth. And it might be because you're so deceived, the only thing you can believe in is a lie, and so you have to turn and twist everything into a lie in order for you to believe it. So you do the same with the word of God. My salvation is not secure. My salvation is not eternal. I have no assurance of salvation. And for those individuals, that just might very well be the truth. Because it's the same people who believe those things also lack the ability to be a doer of the word. They don't practice any of this. They don't practice it. And, and the only thing that's going to prevent you from practicing it is the absence of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit empowers you with the ability to do these things. It empowers you with love. It empowers you with self-control. What is Jesus talking? Self-control. Those who practice. It's not about the establishment of your own righteousness. It's about God and your presence. God who gives you self-control. 
God who ignites within you a sense of love. It's not a lot of people love money more than they love their neighbors. In all of it, and we see, in all of it, the golden rule is love others as you would have them love you. And yet, two years, two years open to this community doing everything I can to put out the word that we're here and they're open, and, and, and it's desolate. It's desolate. Absolutely 100% void of all peoples. It's not me judging you. Your actions judge yourself. Completely void and desolate, void of anything in this chapter. Void uh, of anything good. I was just in Denver last week, and last week, doing work, and, and when I was out there in that, there, there was this lifting of oppression, this oppression lifted up off of me. It's hanging out with my son who said, you know what, Dad, there's no future in that community. I, I just can't find a sense of peace within there. So he moved back to Denver and, and seeing in his face this sense of joy and, and goodness, this release of oppression. And the oppression that was here in this community is absolutely 100% evil. There is evil in this community, and I do believe that's one of the reasons God brought us here. So he begins to desire to establish a glimpse of light, a glimpse of love, some sort of a glimpse of goodness. You can feel the oppression be lifted. I spent a whole week in Denver, and then I come back into this community, and, and you can feel it, you can see it. Just this, this overwhelming dark cloud, and this cloud of oppression that comes over. And, and it's not any of the choices or any of the things we did that creates this oppression. It's the fact that evil is real. It's real and sin is real, and it might be more prevalent in these little communities than it is in the big cities, where in the big cities, everybody seeks good. <laughs> everybody has a common goal in, in, in cities, especially in Denver. Succeed, success. We all want to succeed in life. We all have a common thing, and that is, you know, we, we very community oriented. They want to succeed. They don't sit there going and looking around and trying to, you know, find the dirt within somebody. They're always hoping for the best, trying to do unto others what they would have them do to them. That, that is an overwhelming sense of, of what you get in Denver, where when you come here, the overwhelming sense is, is everybody's looking you over and, and well, let me, let me, let me find the excuse. Let me, let me find the discernment that God has placed in me to do nothing good for you. <laughs> to do nothing good for you. Let me look it over. I, I know there's a reason I'm not doing anything good for you. There's a reason I would never help you out. There's a reason I would never friend you. There's a reason that, that ah, I just can't find within myself any ability to extend to you a sense of mercy, grace, or love. And, and I'm going to find it. That's Ray Colorado. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who lives in heaven. 
For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. One of the reasons we, we had a fundraiser, sending out the letters to the churches, following it up with phone calls, and by the way, only uh, one person answered the phone <laughs> at all the phone calls I made. You don't even answer the phone. They're not there for you when you call out for help, when you need anything. They, they make sure they're, they're absent. Well, what, what, what's to see? What, what, what kind of a spirit lives in this community? Does anyone in this community love God? Does anyone desire to be perfect? So we, we see that the division in this community as we see the division of everybody sitting there in their own denominations and their own churches and their own things and the only people we care about, the only people we help are those who love us, are the brethren of our own little cult. We don't help anyone outside of our cult. We don't help anyone outside of, I don't know where you came from. And I know this, God would have never sent you to our community absent of my approval. I had to approve of it. And, and, and that's always how it is. And that's always what's going on in all these little churches. There is no God, and there's no way I'm going to trust in the God unless I approved of it. I created it. And my hands were on there creating this God. Because why would God send somebody into our community outside of my acceptance and my approval. Maybe it was because God said, I'm void of your church. I'm void of your community. You, you all speak about all these wonderful things about God, but you don't love the God that is. You only love the God you're creating. And the God you're creating is an idol. It's false. It's fake. And of course, if there was a community out there who were dead set on this preaching of salvation is unsecure, we have no assurance of it. It's these people who are void of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, what is he saying? Be the doer. And then we ask, well, how, Lord, am I going to become a doer of something I don't have the strength to do? Open the door to allow God to enter into your heart. Allow Jesus Christ into your mind. Allow Jesus Christ a living place within yourself. And, 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 and as it always is, I, I can complain and bitch and moan all day long about the speck in my brother's eye. But in all of it, I only have control over myself. And no matter how hard I say or no matter how many times I say to this community or the people in this community, I have value, I have worth, I matter. I have a message from God to deliver to a people who are perishing, who have no security of salvation, and, and, and they'll never see the value in it. They'll never validate my worth. Never. And that's always how it is, and that's always how it will be. I, I only have the strength the power over myself. 
Only I can come into a, a dead, dying community filled with evil and, and sit here and every day and every week and every Sunday come and say, this, this, is, this is our prayer, that, that you would save these dead, dying people. I understand and I recognize you. You reign good and you allow both the evil and, and the, the holy, the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous, all to live and coexist. And you reign life and your life is good. But open their eyes. Open their eyes so they may see your presence in this community. Open their eyes and their hearts to be able to receive the power that comes through the Holy Spirit, a spirit full of charity and generosity and goodwill to all people. It's amazing. <laughs> hey, I'm walking around as a Christian and claiming that I love Jesus Christ and the one person I have no stomach for, I have no ability to extend any love or grace to, is the guy who came in the name of Jesus Christ. That guy, whoa! I don't have, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. We gotta we got put our brakes on here. And yet Jesus is saying, love your enemies. And I ain't even one of your enemies. I'm the guy praying for you. Praying for your salvation. The guy praying for those who persecute me. Goes on to say, be aware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, and that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. It's amazing how people, I don't know, since we've been here, we've had four or five different people secretly come knocking on our door asking for help. And each time we, we help them. Even when we, we really didn't have the means to be helping people, we still found within ourselves that sense of discernment of, well, because God is in me. I'm going to do unto someone else exactly what I wish they would do unto us. I remember that that pastor, you know, over there at New Life Church in Eckley comes and he decides that he's going to take the opportunity to insult me there when we're asking for help. Oh, well, I tried to warn you. I tried to tell you I'm bound by the law. And we being a nonprofit organization, we can't go out helping and freely giving our money away. And it was never about, hey, you, you could have reached into your pocket and helped us out. You didn't, you didn't even have to take up a collection from your church. Sure, that would have been nice. That would have been the godly thing to do. That, that would have displayed a sense of holiness within your community. But there is no holiness in your community. No, you're out there parading around to be seen by others. And, and if I'm going to do something good, we're going to provide lunch for everyone at a free cost and all this stuff. And we're going to pat everybody on the back. But we're only doing that for the brothers whom we accept, those who love us. Those that didn't care for us, our own brothers, we, you know, our secret special group. And it's all to be done to be seen by others. Let me show you my sense of righteousness. Let me show you how good I am. Let me pull the chair off where you come sit down, sweetheart, and eat my free lunch and all this stuff. But in secret, 
the ravenous wolf. In, in secret, I, I, I have no desire to help you or to engage in any of your struggles or your problems or that stuff because there's no reward in it that they see. Their reward comes from the acceptance of mankind and not the things that please God. And you say, why, why are you picking on these guys? I'm not picking on these guys. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to repent, to have a changing of the heart, to have a changing of the mind. If they had done something different, I would have told you that. Your own actions judge you. Not me, I'm not judging you in one way or another. The word of God is judging you. Oh, don't let David come and judge me. Who do you think you are? Why would you even be concerned about my judgment? Why don't you concern yourselves with the judgment of God? With the judgments of God. It's God's word judging you. It's the word of Jesus Christ judging you. And what's judged you? Your own actions. Your own actions. Even trying to justify your own sin by saying I'm bound by a law. A law that says, yeah, I can't do good. I can't be charitable. I, I can't extend to you grace and mercy. The only time I can do anything good and nice is, is when we have a gathering of folks because I love being first. I love the greetings in the marketplaces. I'm a hypocrite. My righteousness is only to be seen by men. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, when you receive received their reward, but they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Again, Jesus saying, we're talking about a personal relationship with God. And so many of us are trying to establish our rights. When it's, when it's about my righteousness, when, it, when it's about my virtue, it, it's always a display for the acceptance of people. And when, when my, my, my salvation is determined upon your acceptance or, or your gratitude or, or whatever it is, your validation, I'm always going to fall short. I'll never have a sense of assurance. My salvation will never be secure. Never. Be because it's, a, it's about the validation of mankind. And I think that's what really terrifies this town. That I could come here every Sunday and not be here for one moment seeking the validation of anyone. I'm not here seeking the value. If I was here seeking the validation of these people, I, I would be tickling your ear with everything you wanted to hear. I'd be sitting here trying to flatter you and manipulating you and, and telling you all these wonderful things, only the things you want to hear, and instead of never speaking about the things you need to know, the things you should be hearing. And then again, it's, it's there about the personal relationship with God. You know, I continue on doing these things, not, not for one moment because of the financial gain I'm getting from it. Because there is none. There is no financial gain. It, it, it's, about, it's about a sacrifice, sacrificing my will for the will of God. Being that living sacrifice. And trust me, there, there's no way I could continue doing this had Jesus Christ not said, this is what you're going to do. 
had, had I not come under the authority of Christ. And on all of that came in, in secret places. When I was on my knees in my room, and there was nobody there but me and God, surely God speaks to us and each one of us in a very personal way. That's why you, you never see here in our church that us say, hey, you know what you need to do? In order to be saved, raise your right hand and repeat after me. You know why I don't preach that message? Because that's phony, it's baloney. Even Peter, when he says to the people, repent, turn away, call on the name of Jesus Christ, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, right? And, and, and receive the Holy Spirit. Peter never says to anyone, repeat after me. He would never be so bold in the, trying to convince someone that, that I am in control over your salvation. It, it is void of sincerity. It's void of sincerity. And if you want to be saved, you need to be sincere. And this should happen and come through the sincere emotions and feelings and things being generated from within your own heart. This should be a personal thing between you and God. Even Jesus never says, here, repeat after me. Some of the disciples did ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And it's amazing that when these people say, hey, raise your right hand and repeat after me, they don't even teach you how to pray. They don't even teach you how to pray the Lord's Prayer. No, we're, we're going to do this thing, the, the sinner's prayer, and, and you just say, I repent of my sins, and there, that's all you got to do. And yet in it, <laughs> To repent of someone's sins is to have a complete turnaround, a turnabout, and, and becoming a new creation in Jesus Christ. It's not words, it's actions. Who is saved, he who is a doer of the word will be justified. And if it has reverence in your life, importance in your life, if it's special, if it's wonderful, then it needs to be a sincere thing coming and being generated from the depths of your own heart and your own situation. It says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father who lives in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespass, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus clearly saying that if you want to come to God, you better come to God with forgiveness in your heart. And you need to forgive those first. Forgive those first. And that's one of the things that keeps me from breaking down. It's my ability to forgive. Forgive a people who are constantly rejecting us. To forgive a people who refuse to validate us. To forgive a people who are constantly seeking to, to break us down. And, and they seek to break us down through these unrighteous and holy acts of hypocrisy. 
but we forget. And we keep our hope. Our hope is in God. And our hope is that one day God would use this place to establish a sense of holiness and righteousness, giving to, to a people who are broken and being abused a sense of assurance and the security of salvation that always comes through the word of God. Forgive, and God will forgive you. And so Jesus is saying it's about mercy. We read from Micah a few days ago and being reassured to the prophet Micah that that salvation is eternal. God's promises are eternal. And that God's desire, if you read all of Micah, what is God's desire for the people? That they'd be merciful. They would show mercy. This is one of the, the fruits of, of God's Holy Spirit within our lives. We have the power to condemn, but we choose not to condemn. Instead, we seek to save. We have the power to punish, but we seek not to punish. We show mercy. Mercy is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus saying, in establishing salvation, these are those who are saved, those who are doers of the word. Those who are doers. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. A lot of people see and think and have been deceived into believing that fasting is the withholding of food or, or the withholding of pleasure water, drink, soda pops, whatever. The things that bring you pleasure in life, I'm going to withhold those things from myself, put myself in a state of suffering and discomfort, right? In order to get my prayers answered. Because I'm seeking personal gain. It's always about personal gain. I'm seeking more money. I'm seeking a better job. I'm seeking more friends. I'm seeking to establish my success in this world, and so I'm going to put myself in a place of discomfort in order for God to see, you know, that that is deception, that's devil. God says, this is the fasting I desire. You would loosen the bonds of those who are suffering by tending to the needs of the poor, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty. So in other words, a true holy fast in the eyes of God is for us to get involved at the food pantry or the food bank and be able to, to get involved into other people's struggles and problems. Many people go and they work at these food pantries and they donate time in that and in that they do it to make themselves feel better. Oh, look how good and nice I am. I'm out there doing these things, but in that they withhold the goodness of God. Instead of blessing these people because they're in need and seeing these people's struggles and wanting to be in their struggles and in their struggles trying to become the solution to those struggles. You bless them. Not, you know, here in, in most communities, you can only, they have all these rules and regulations, right? You can only come to the food pantry or the food bank twice a month. And, and, and so I come 
and, and I'm struggling. And usually the people who are struggling are, are those who are on Social Security, the elderly, the sick and the disabled, right? Not usually homeless and drug addicts and things of that nature. People who need help, widows and orphans and people like that in their distress. And so I, I'm gonna gather together and I'm gonna give them, you know, one day's meal. I'll give you a little breakfast, a little lunch, and a little dinner. And here you go. And, and oh, how thankful you are for a wonderful person like me. Hey, Jan, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of all your good giving. And oh, man, I go home and I feel so good. I, I just gave that person a meal. And, and instead of recognizing and understanding, if they can only come once every two weeks or twice a month, why don't, you, why don't you give them, you know, like a whole week's worth of food? That means five breakfasts, five lunches, and five dinners. Let me bless them with the goodness of God. And blessing people with the goodness of God, right? Uh, we, we went through some of that studies and we're talking, it's not about me establishing my own righteousness, seeking my own personal gain. Because you're important, because you matter, I'm going to do something great for you. And I give absent of expecting anything in return. Not even a pat on the back from Jan or anyone else in the program. It's, it's not about me. It's not about me feeling good about myself. It's about you and your struggle, and I want you to know you're important. I want you to know God loves you. God has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. I want to remind you that the love of God is being manifested right here through this pantry and this food bank. And so I'm going to bless you with everything you need. With all your needs. You know, I, I, I know for a fact I when I'm working at a food pantry for myself in a food bank there in Denver for five hundred dollars and I'm sure prices have gone up now that you know the evil crime family is controlling over Denver and Colorado and the United States of America for that matter. Prices have probably gone up, but there, you know, a few years ago when we were there and I was working there. For $500, you could get 2,000 pounds of food, a whole ton of food, for $500. And, of course, they're feeding hundreds of people. And that was a very well-run, operated food bank thing. And I don't want to take discredit them. And then you come out to this community, <laughs> and they, like, they're so stingy so stingy with their stuff. And they don't even have any customers lined up. I went there and worked there for like three, four weeks and ended up being there for three, four weeks. I don't think 10 people showed up. And yet, very stingy with what they wanted to help with. I give you one day's meal and expect you to, to live for the next two weeks off this one day's meal, one breakfast, one lunch, and one dinner. And what are you doing? Why, why even do it? I mean, these people need help. They don't need insulted. There, there's something in here that's, that's missing in this community. I see it. You know why I see it? Because I've met Jesus Christ. And I saw in Jesus Christ the magnitude of God's love. And how in Jesus Christ there is no darkness. None. Be pure light. He is pure love. I saw the goodness in Jesus Christ. And maybe because I met Jesus Christ, I can no longer see the goodness of man or even come to believe that anything man can produce is good. It's disgusting. 
And, and the reason it became disgusting to me is because I saw what perfect was. I saw what pure was. I saw the immense enormity of love in Jesus Christ. And, and there's nothing in this world compares to it. Nothing. And I just think, boy, if, if Jesus Christ was alive in any of these people, if Jesus Christ was alive in you, just a small amount of that purity would, would be enough to, to shine forth and, and, and be awe-inspiring. You'd be like, wow. That's one thing I know. You're not very smart. You're kind of ignorant. But that's one thing I know. You were with God. And how do I know you were with God? Because the light you shine forth is pure. The love you shine forth is awe-inspiring. It's wonderful. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up your treasures in heaven, where moth and rust, where moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In all things, we cannot serve two masters. You're either serving the devil and the desires of the devil, or you're not. You're either living in sin, or you're not. You're either saved, or you're not. That's why we're black and white. It, it, it is a symbolic statement. Either you believe or you don't believe. And there is no in between. Who will be saved? Everyone who believes. Everyone who makes the Lord their trust. Everyone who hopes in the Lord. Everyone who's been baptized into the Holy Spirit. In that you're putting your trust into the teachings and instructions of God that command us to love one another just as he has loved us. Commands us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Th this is the production of salvation in our world. And, and when you come into a world, into a place where these things aren't being produced, I don't care if you go to church or you've been to church or you're religious or not religious, it doesn't matter. When these things are not being produced, it makes me feel like God is void of the situation. God is absent because God is the power inside these things. Sure, we, we can't do it on our own. I get it and I understand. But for everyone who believes, nothing is impossible. There's no thing impossible for God. All things are possible. And Jesus Christ says, those who are saved, those who love me, will do the things I do. They'll do the things I do. And so Jesus, when he says, love your enemies, these are the things I do. When Jesus says, be generous to those who ask, these are the things I do. When Jesus says, feed and tend to the needs of the poor, not to establish your own good, but because these people have value, and their value to be, this is what I do. Jesus says, 
If anyone comes to me and asks me to walk a mile with them, I go two miles. This is what I do. I'm not asking you to do anything I don't do or I'm not willing to do. When I say pray for those who are persecuting you, this is what I do. I do these things in order for your assurance to be sealed in his promises, which are our salvation. Forgive. This is what I do. I extend mercy and grace to those who are undeserving of it. And obviously, that's what we do. That's what we do here. We never go out of the church bitching and moaning and complaining and yelling and screaming at the people who, who are doing us wrong. I, I go out there and I try to be nice and, and kind to them by extending them mercy and, and grace. I sit back praying for them and praying that, that God would shine his light unto their lives so their eyes would be open and be able to receive his Holy Spirit. I pray for their lives. Do I also complain? I do. I complain because it bothers me. It bothers me that the fruits of the Holy Spirit are not being seen or produced in this community. And so I complain about that. I want God and I want to be in the presence of God. In that I find my peace. Again, Jesus says, therefore I tell you not to be anxious about your life. Once saved, always saved. Don't be anxious about your life. Jesus is clearly saying, I'm in control. I'm in control. You're not in control. So it's to surrender this illusion of free will, surrendering that illusion, because in free will, I think, is where we come up with the anxiety, this thought of free will, or our anxieties and our depressions and our inabilities to establish good stuff. We're, we're trying to establish something we're not absent of, of God. So it's a surrender. We surrender our will for the will of God, just as he says, let your will be done, your kingdom come. Surrender. We're surrendering to the truth. Don't be worried about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor they reap, nor they gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He tends to their needs. He gives them everything they need. That's us, through a lack of faith, store up in our barns. And we're always trying to prepare for tomorrow, prepare for the future. And in that, we never take the time to smell today's roses, to enjoy what we have. And what we have is God in our presence. We're not waiting for eternal life to begin. People who lack the assurance of salvation are waiting for eternal life to come. No, I'm in the midst of eternal life. I'm so much in the midst of eternal life. I was crucified 2,000 years ago, and yet here I stand today boldly proclaiming God's word. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan? Which of you can add one hour? People who say they have lack the assurance and security of salvation believe that being anxious and being careful to be righteous through the establishment of a false righteousness are never secure, always trying to achieve something that they don't have any control over. 
They can't add one hour to their life. And, it, and that includes eternal life. That includes salvation. Why? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do, be, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, and what shall we drink, and what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need all of them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. For the day is its own trouble. And so it is, just as Jesus was saying, even back there in the days of Moses, when God was giving the manna, do not store up for yourself tomorrow, only eat what you can today. God has given us enough faith for today, and all we need is this faith for today. It's not about tomorrow or the faithfulness of tomorrow. <laughs> I have no control over tomorrow, and tomorrow comes with its own problems. So what is Jesus Christ saying? You have now, and you always have now. And right now, you're in the hand of God. So why are you worried? Where is this insecurity coming from? Why don't you have assurance? For those who have God, I'm not worried. I don't have anxiety. Right now, I have everything I need. And what I have, I found in God. Let me finish up here. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. And even so, Jesus says, ask and it will be given, knock, and the door will be open to you. If you ask for salvation, if you ask God to deliver you from the evil one, then you are, will be delivered. Good God is not going to deliver you into the hands of evil. A good God is going to deliver you out of that hand. A good God isn't going to deliver you or lead you down a path where you can be tempted, to be tempted to... to uh, such a way that you're going to lose your salvation. Because see, God loves you. God cares about you. So he leads you away from temptation. And, and if we ask, we shall receive. If you ask for the Holy Spirit to come and, and take over your life, it, he will come. He will take over your life. Verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 15, book of Matthew says this. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from the thorn bushes or figs from the thistles? So every healthy tree that bears good fruit but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a d diseased tree bear good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So why do we speak of this stuff? It's not me judging them, and I'm not trying to shame anyone. Your fruits determine who you are. Your own actions judge you.
own actions. It's not me judging you. It's your lifestyle, the way you live your life. How you twist the word of truth into a lie so you can believe. And the only thing you, you, you believe in is the justification of your sin. The only reason you came to Jesus Christ was to be free from the penalty of sin. For those who are believers came to Jesus Christ to be freed from sin. They can't produce good. I've been going to these Bible studies and I don't even think I can go anymore because of the, the way they treat you. And it's the little subtle things that they do. One, they give approval to the spirit of Jezebel. The pastor is a pretty nice guy, in a way, as long as you don't ask him for anything. But his wife is full of a demonic evil spirit, spirit of Jezebel, and the pastor You'd swear to God you were in the presence of Ahab. And it, it, it's, I don't know. I don't know. Again, this is what put us on the path uh, of this message. I think this message is very important. And I truly wish we could get this message out to this community. It's amazing how on Facebook, if I sent out 99 friend requests in the community of Ray, 100% of those 99, the Facebook puts out a warning. You don't know that person and you're not allowed to send that person. But you can't be friends with anybody. Anybody so choose. There, there's not a more disgusting app created in the world than Facebook. It's evil. The people who control over it are evil. And, and most of the people who spend all their time in it are evil. It's just a, a place to spawn evil. And if anyone brings the gospel of Jesus Christ, well, they, they begin closing the door and they begin shutting it down. It's all because of what I have to preach. And the people I'm trying to reach out to, it's not that the people are saying, we, we don't want to be friends with you, even though there's one out of the 99 that I can send a friend request. They don't accept my request because I'm a stranger or whatever it may be. And each one of us has the right to say no or say yes to anyone we so choose. But, but it's really disgusting in my eyes when somebody says to you, hey, you, you can't be friends with that person. You, you can't tell that person the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hate Facebook. I think it's a place of pure evil. And the only reason I use it is to shine a light in the midst of those who sit in darkness. And that light is Jesus Christ. And it's been difficult. I'm not gonna allow the devil to dictate to us what we can and what we cannot do. We're gonna keep moving. This inability to produce good fruit you know, inability to produce kindness, love, mercy, all the while trying to establish or justify the reasons they don't. The reasons they don't. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, 
many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Again, who are saved, who's going to be saved? The doers of the word. Not the workers of lawlessness. And Jesus clearly says, the workers of lawlessness usually are those who are hypocrites. They say one thing and yet their actions absolutely don't support it. They say, oh, I, I'm going to go to the grocery store and say to the person at the store, may mercy be multiplied to you in the name of God. And they probably don't have the gall to say in the name of Jesus Christ in the middle of the grocery store. But nevertheless, it's not about saying to that person, may mercy be multiplied to you. It's about me multiplying mercy in your life through acts of kindness, through acts of hospitality, through acts of charity and, and generosity, doing unto others as I would have them do unto me. You know, that's the thing that I want to Stop with this, Jesus says, right? And you were never saved. You, it wasn't that you had salvation and then you lost it. I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness. Never saved. Never saved. Even though they, they came and, and again, as you see, it was about the establishment of themselves. Did we? not do these things in your name. And yet within them, even if they come bearing the name of Jesus Christ, within them it is a sense of that ravenous wolf, a dead, dying, diseased tree. Can't produce good, can't produce forgiveness, can't produce love. They spoke the word but they didn't do the word. Workers of lawlessness. I'm bound by a law that says, I can't help you. And even though my hand can stick right in my pocket and grab onto my money and pull it out of my, with my own free will and my own desire to help you because you're important. I could do that, but I'm bound by a law. I'm justified. It's okay. I don't, I, don't, I, don't have to, I don't have to do nothing for you. And you're right. And the reason you don't, you never knew Christ. It's the only way I see it. That's my complaint. My complaint is, how are these people been so deceived and so blinded they can't see the hypocrisy in what they're doing, the deception in what they're doing. How can you not see these people trying to justify their sin instead of admitting and confessing sin is wrong? Friend, right? If anybody out here knows what it's like to have no friends, that's me. It's not like I, I, even if I had a telephone and, and I had it and I wanted to call someone on the phone and say, hey man, uh, how's your day going? Hey man, let me uh, burden you with some of my struggles and my problems. That doesn't exist for me. Because I don't have no friends. I don't have any friends. There's nobody I can turn to with my problems. And what makes a friend a good friend? A friend is someone who is there for you when you need them. That's why they're a friend. Oh, you need me? You call me. You need help? I'll be there to help you. Oh, I, I see you're sad and you're struggling. I'm there during those times when you're sad and you're struggling. And, and you want someone to cry with you? I will cry with you. I'll be there for you. 
when, when, when you're broke down and on your knees, I'm the one who's going to come along and I'm going to pick you up. This is why you call me friend. And Jesus not only calls us friends, I'm your friend, I'm your brother, I'm your father in heaven. I do all these things. When I cry out and I need help, right? Who's going to help me? Who's going to respond? My friend, Jesus Christ. When I was struggling and then having problems and troubles, and I cried out to the Lord, and Jesus Christ responded. He heard my prayers. And yet the very people who said, I love God, are void of Jesus Christ. Because when I cried out, you did not respond. You did not help. You did nothing. You start far off. My found friendship in Jesus Christ and yet the one place I can't find a friend, I could never trust anyone with my feelings, or my emotions, or my stuff, are the people who claim they love God in this community. And that's discerning to me. That's concerning. That's what's going on. It's horrible. I should always find a friend in Jesus Christ. And so what do we do? What is this problem? What's the solution to the problem? My number is 720-388-3867. I'm going to be the guy you refuse to be. Our doors are open. Come on down. You're welcome in, in this house of prayer. It's a prayer open to all nations, to all people anywhere. To you, the alcoholic. To you, the drug addict. To you who are depressed. To you who have no friends, whoever you may be. Our house is open to you. Doors are open every Sunday at 8 o'clock in the morning. And most days of the week. Not just here. You call our phone number, we're going to answer the phone. We're going to get back to you. Because everyone who calls to the Lord seeking a friend is going to find a friend. When people come knocking on our door seeking for financial help, we help them. Even when it leaves us burdened, we help them. Recognize and understand. Be a doer. Be a doer. It's one thing this world needs today. People who do and follow through on their pledge. Be a doer of the word. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you always. We thank you for your love and your grace that you continually extend into our lives and give us the strength and the power to extend that mercy and grace into a dead, dying community. Bring this community back to life. Rise this community up from the ashes of the grave. So they may praise your name. So the world may praise your name. So the satellites that roam across the earth and go to and fro may one day look upon Ray, Colorado, and everyone say, what happened to Ray? And we all together say, God came. God came. And he visited us. And so let this city and this community shine forth the glory of your goodness. Rise up this community so it may be established as your kingdom. Let your kingdom come. The power and authority of it be established here in this community. Rise up for yourself. Righteous and holy men, so that your name may be always praised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for continuing to use us, even during those times when we couldn't feel or see the value in ourselves. Thank you, Jesus for being my friend, my brother, and my father. 
Amen.